So this is Jam Candy Co. by me. I just made this presentation last night, so it's a little bit brief. My apologies. So our name, Jam stands for Jordan Mason and John Mason. My grandfather, John Mason, uh, has the same first and middle initial as me, and since he gave me the recipe for the candy, as you can see here, this is our peanut brittle, that's our toffee. Um, since he gave me the recipe and taught me how to make it, I felt that I should honor him within the name. Oh, sure. And then that's my grandfather, and that's me just recently. A little bit about myself and JM. So I started making the candy in first grade. Um, it took me a while to convince my parents because one day we're in the car on the way home from school, and my grandfather gives my dad a call and says, do you want to learn how to make the candy? Since nobody else in our family wanted to do it, I felt that as his grandchild, it should be my duty to carry on his, his tradition. So I decided to make the candy, and I convinced my parents over a span of three days. They drove me down to Olympia that Friday, and I learned how to make it. Um, we, in the beginning, um, we had a dinner with some friends that owned a store called Vino Teak and Lakewood. Some of you may remember, some of you may not. Um, and I just stood up in the middle of dinner, and without my parents' consent, I just started pitching my idea to them. And at the end, I just said, do you want to sell my candy or not? And they didn't even blink an eye, and they said, of course we'll sell your candy. I mean, but why would they say no, of course? Um, <laughs> So anyway, starting in second grade, you know, I had that little outlet. But about a year and a half later, two years later, they retired and moved away, sold their store. So I was out of business for a while. And I was just giving it away to family and friends. My dad would give it as gifts to his clients. I'd have small events. And then I'm now in eighth grade, and I'm just trying to take it to the next level. So. Company roots. So my grandfather made candy over 70 years. Um, he never made it a business, however. And he was just refining his recipe for all that time. And there's him making it when he taught me. And he only made it for close family and friends. It wasn't something that, you know, was really known to the public. I mean, his friends of his, I mean, he was a lobbyist. So, I mean, like, if he had a business event, he'd bring some candy. And close friends of his, you know, knew that he made the candy and they loved it. So, I mean, if he were to stop, then who's going to continue it? Our candies. So, again, this is the peanut brittle and this is the toffee. And we use the finest ingredients for jam, peanut brittle and jam toffee. So for the peanut brittle, I order raw jumbo peanuts from North Carolina from a vendor my grandfather's used for many years. He says they're the best peanuts for peanut brittle. And they're off of a farm, and I get this 50-pound sack that I can barely carry myself. And he says they're the best for peanut brittles, so that's why I choose them. And then the chocolate we get is milk chocolate from a local vendor. I make sure that there's nothing you can't pronounce. I'm not for organic stuff because if we, this is kind of off topic, but if we, the whole country was to go organic, we need a space the size of California for that. Anyway, I just try to make sure that it's, it's you know, good material. So then where to buy jam candy? We currently sell at Metropolitan Market Tacoma, H&L Produce in Lakewood, Dries in Olympia. We also are at Timothy DeClue, which is a card store and kind of like a Watson and Kenny, if you guys know what that is. It's like an upscale store in Seattle. I've done three events in which I sell my candy at Nordstrom Tacoma, and we're working on, you know, like getting it into the cafe bar there right now. So, And then we're also working on getting into the West Seattle Metropolitan Market. That's my next client I'm meeting with. And are moving into a new location with Kirk's Pharmacy, because Kirk Pharmacy is on my website. So, And then our philanthropy. For each bag sold, as you can see on the label, we have a partnership with Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Why do you ask? It's because three out of four of my grandparents have had and do have cancer. And I just feel like I want to help figure out a way to end cancer because everybody that I know, everybody has been affected by cancer or knows somebody who's been affected by cancer. And my grandmother's here today, and she's a survivor of seven years when she was like on her deathbed. You know, She only had a little bit to live, and there's a very rare chance of her surviving, and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance is responsible for helping her. Okay, so here's some of my triumphs and challenges. My largest triumph is getting into Metropolitan Market Tacoma because for somebody who makes a craft such as I do, that's kind of like a big deal because that's the upscale store in Tacoma and then the Northwest. And then my other thing is having a live King 5 interview. I don't know if any of you saw, but just a couple months ago, I was on King 5 on a segment called Take 5 where I talked about my business and I was interviewed by Mr. Chris Cashman, so it was very interesting. And then I've had many charity events that have gone well because I feel giving back is one of my goals with this business, not just money, it's all about giving back. And my, one of my largest triumphs, because these aren't in order, but keeping my business alive since first grade. So I believe it's 90% of startups fail within the first five years, been alive six years, and I have no intent on ever failing. 
if I if this fails, then I'll go on to something else and I'll just keep going. And I just feel that it's important because at at age seven when I started this, you know, people are like, oh, this isn't serious. But now it's really serious and people have to take me seriously after six years. So selling my candy at Nordstrom and expanding to new cities, I'm all up and down Washington and having a partnership with Gale Earth Catering. Some of you may have heard that name. They've won Best Cater several years in a row. Um, they've just helped me tremendously and influenced me. I've had many people who have influenced me, such as my family. They've been very supportive. The owners of Gale Orth Catering have been very supportive of me. I've hired my employee through them, through a subcontractor. Um, I signed a non-compete with them. That way, you know, they can't take the recipe or anything, even though I trust them, I just, just for liability issues. And my challenges are filling out paperwork for the state because there's a lot of paperwork. Understanding the licenses needed, learning my accounting, because I had to do that all by myself. But my aunt back there, she taught me how to do accounting. She's been an accountant for many years. Tracking sales, that's, that's been one of my challenges. I'm still working on having a more organized approach and not just a sporadic way of you know, setting aside papers. And understanding the grocery stores. Because when you have a product such as food, something that you sell in a grocery store, it's very complicated to get into a grocery store. And you have to know the ins and outs of the way they work. Because sometimes they're reliable, sometimes they're not. It all comes down to the people managing that store. And then understanding and getting the correct labels. Because, I mean, there's just so many regulations. I mean, you have to have dates. You have to have UPCs. and It's all money, money, money. And then taxes, taxes, and taxes. There's always something I need to pay. Quarterly reports I have to file to the state. I'm sure you guys have all learned that. How can you start a business? Number one is the idea. Is it practical? Is it profitable? Is it sustainable over time? The execution. Is it realistic? Will you actually do it? And I mean, will you actually do it? Because I know people who will talk about a business, but never put their words into actions. If you don't put your words into actions, you're never going to know if your business will be successful or not. Do you have the funds or an investor with the funds? That means a question mark. I don't know why I didn't fix that. Because if you don't have funds, then it's really hard because you're going to be climbing an uphill battle. You need to make sure that you have some kind of financial support. Growing the business. Can you manage it? Do you have competition? You really need to analyze if you have competition. Because you have to have, if you have competition, you need to look and see how you can work around them and how you can defeat them. Marketing. I mean, that's a good way to get around competition because the more that your word is out there, you know, between people and there's, you know, networking events, that's really what's going to help grow your business. Are you making a profit and is it scalable? If you're not making a profit, then you obviously are not going to be able to grow your business. And if it's not scalable, I mean, for example, my business in the beginning I thought was not scalable, but I figured out a way by partnering with this commercial kitchen in order to have an employee. Because if I didn't have an employee, it would just be me making it all the time. Like before, I could not scale my business because I'm in school. I can't fill all these orders. And you must know your numbers. If you don't know your numbers, I mean, how many here, can I just take a quick vote? How many of you have watched Shark Tank before? Almost everybody here has at least watched Shark Tank once. I don't know how many times I see people come onto Shark Tank and they have no clue what their numbers are. They can't answer any of the questions that the sharks are giving them. How are you going to be well respected as somebody in business if you don't know your numbers? Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Yes? I just want to say you're so adorable. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, do you, make, do you plan on making any other candies? Like yes. Strawberries, milk chocolate? Um, yeah, I'm actually working on several other candies right now that will be rolling out soon. I can't disclose those candies because, you know, just an idea for sake, so. How do you approach? Oh, did you put the um, How do you approach like uh, new clients? Like you cold calling them, or are you going up in person? How are you contacting? Like, Networking, I would say. Yeah, but how how do you do your networking as far as? always seems to be somebody mutual. So if my mom knows somebody, and she introduces me to them, I will always hand them my business card. I always have business cards on me, and I give it to them, and then sometimes they'll email me, sometimes I'll call them if they give me their card. For example, for example, Mr. Cold Jam, I was, again, at Nordstrom, and Shirley, Mrs. Knapp, uh, the saleswoman that I've always worked with and he works with, she's a mutual friend, and she introduced me to Mr. Cold Jam, and I gave him his card, he gave me his card. I, sorry, words. Anyway. Um, <laughs> It, it all comes down to mutual things and then networking events as well. So charity events, I always give them business cards and ways and means to contact me. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, could you go back 
slide? Yeah. I have a question, Jordan. Yes. I've had your peanut butter, I have your candy, and I mean, I mean, it's good, but what what do you think is the wow factor of that candy? Why do why do you think Nordstrom's and Met Mark is interested in, in purchasing all that? Well, there's nothing that angers me more than bad candy. Okay, as you can see, I'm a very soft person. Okay, I know my candy, and. The thing about my peanut brittle, for example, is I just find that other peanut brittles, they don't put peanuts. It's more brittle than peanuts. That, that's more, that, peanut brittle is supposed to be majority peanuts. The, the brittle part is covering the peanuts. It's not supposed to be, you know, just corn syrup and, and sugar and, and solidified. That's not what candy is. It has to have some kind of component that's natural, like the peanuts. And it has a great complexity of sweet and salty. And I feel like a lot of candies are just flat out too sweet, flat out too salty. I mean, I think that is just something that's really good. You can pair it with anything. And then the toffee, I always try to make sure, again, sweet and salty. I'm a big sweet and salty person. I don't like candies that are just like, give you a stomach ache. I feel other candies, other toffees, other peanut brittles I've had, you eat a bag of it and you get a stomach ache. That's why I feel my toffee is something that will compete with other toffees. So. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. So you, you're more about the ingredients. So yes, the, the ingredients and the technique. My grandfather taught me a specific way and I'm never gonna change that way. I'm never gonna resort to different ingredients because I feel I'd rather have people get a quality product and pay a little bit more than have a mediocre product that you see everywhere. I mean, you can go to any store and, and get a Snickers bar, but you can't go to any store and find something handmade, select. You can't do that just today. And I feel that if you sacrifice quality, you may have more quantity, but that doesn't mean the consumer is going to be happy. I mean, if you get a Snickers, it's going to be consistent every time, but it doesn't have the homemade feel that my candy does. <clears throat> yes? So I'm not real business savvy, so I want to know what your last big, bold point is. What does that mean? So if somebody asks you, what are your margins? And you don't know what your margins are. So, like, if it let's just say it costs you, for me, cost me a dollar fifty to make a bag of candy, and I price it at six dollars for Metropolitan Market to buy, not because I sell to them wholesale and then they mark it up. You, if you don't know that, and somebody asks you, it's gonna make you look bad because if you don't like understand what your product is and what it's selling for and what you're bringing in then how are you supposed to know about your business? How are you going to show somebody that you know about your business? How are they going to know about your business, more importantly? Does that answer your question? OK. So Any how other? how do you control your cost of goods? I know uh, peanuts uh, is like a commodity and all that, but it fluctuates. Yes. Do you, do you have a broker, a peanut broker? No. So I mean, right now, I really haven't had to think about that. But I would say the way I control my prices is I always go to a consistent vendor. I'm always looking for a cheap price but I'm always going to a consistent vendor. I always go to cash and carry to get almonds. I always go to Costco to get butter. I always go to the same vendor that I've, my grandfather's used for 20, 30, 40 years to get the peanuts because they know that I'm a consistent customer and if they you know, fluctuate their price, you know, I may be like, yeah, I'm gonna go somewhere else. I mean, it comes down to them wanting to keep clients also. So why do you go to Costco and cash and carry? Why do you go to Cisco or, or places like that who give you a better pricing than Costco. I've really worked, looked at Cisco. I mean, just that's just what I've done since the beginning is gone to Costco because I have a license, I mean, not a license, but like a card to get into Costco. But I've also looked at other, oper like, uh, other options. So I've like have a wholesaler, or uh, not a wholesaler, but I have somebody that's a firm in, in Fife, and they had a lot of things, but they didn't have the ingredients that my grandfathers use, the same things that are just naturally available to me as somebody who makes candy. I always try to use the same ingredients because it can totally affect the taste. They don't have what I'm looking for. So like when I get the almonds, I'm looking for almond slivers and it has to have the skin on it. But if I go to, for example, I think this one was called Peterson um, and they didn't have those almonds. They'd have to do a special order. They'd have to do something else. I don't, I can't sacrifice my quality. Something that people like about my candy is it is consistent every single time. <laughs> All right, so like, what's the long-term plan for this business? You're in like uh, middle school, like right now. Uh, what happens like after high school, like after you graduate? 
So my plan is I want to go to college and then I'm going to use this business to pay for my law school. Um, but what I'd like to do is I would like to hire a manager and here in Tacoma, somebody, I always try to look for people better than I am to hire, I mean, to manage it. My mom is, you know, she's in project management. I'm thinking about, you know, signing it to her. Um, but because once once she signs it to me, I'll sign it back to her, or she can just keep it, or however we want to do it. Because I'm not 18, so legally speaking, it's my mom and dad's business. So I might have my mom do it because my mom is looking at you know going from her job and starting her own business, and that may be something that she can manage. But what I would like to do is find somebody to manage it while I'm away, and they can just report to me, and I can do things if they have questions. So. But is it, can we follow up on that? So law school. Once you're through with law school, will you be a candy-making attorney? No. So what I'd like to do is, I'd, again, hire a manager. And I'm going to move to New York with a friend of mine. I'd, I actually maybe will go to military uh, academy. It's another option for me to pay for school. Um, but my good friend of mine, we're going to go to New York. We're going to open a law firm. And once it gains some worth, hopefully, or gain some uh, revenue, we'd like to sell that law firm and start a conglomerate of businesses. Because I'm somebody who, instead of just focusing on immigration law, because that's what I'm interested in, my friend, criminal defense attorney, I mean, we need those right now. I feel that once I sell that law firm, I'll have enough money to keep building and building and building and building and building and reinvesting. And I feel that's the best way to you know, become a good entrepreneur. But you had a question? Yeah, it's kind of a two-parter. So was it, how is it that you personally handle rejection? Say someone turns you down or someone doesn't take you seriously in a meeting. One, how do you deal with that? And two, how do you grab their attention then or try and set yourself, obviously, apart from the rest? I realize you got the quality and definitely the personal skills, my goodness. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so either one of those, just fire away. OK, so when somebody doesn't take me seriously, you know, I understand that. I'm 13. It's really hard for people to grasp that aspect. That's OK. You know, I'm going to let people think what they want to think. But I'm going to come back, and I'm going to show them who I am. For example, before I did my King 5 News interview, people were like, he doesn't have a lot of you know, media coverage. Once I got that, I had a lot of people coming forward and being very impressed. For example, the other day, I was meeting with some of my mom's old bosses that are very big in, in Seattle. And some of them are multimillionaires. And you know, at first, I think, oh, you know. This isn't a big deal. Like, Mr. Cole James, like, oh, is he just reselling gummy bears or something? Once I actually explain to them, it always seems like people seem to understand where I'm coming from more and that I'm not just playing around. Yeah. And then, what, could you repeat the other question? Hmm. Oh, just, I mean, since you're so young, how is it that you set yourself apart from the rest of everybody else? Obviously, you got the quality and you know your numbers and you can explain things really well. But say, that all of that isn't enough, what do you do to grab someone's attention, say, if you're in a meeting or something like that? If I'm in a meeting and people are just you know, talking and talking and talking, I've had several times, for example, Metropolitan Market, I will literally just stand up while everybody's sitting and I'll say, do we have a deal or not? Because it seems like you guys <laughs> like this. I did that at Metropolitan Market. I'm standing up, do we have a deal or not? And they're like, OK, we have a deal. And I shook their hand and I walked out of there. I'm not afraid to be direct to them. If, when I don't need to be direct, then I won't be direct, and you know, I'll take an abstract understanding of something. But when I need to be direct, I'll be direct, and that grabs people's attention. OK, so any other questions? Would it be too rude to ask what kind of volume you're doing these days? Like sales, like in yeah, earnings? sales or? I'd prefer not to talk about it. Um, okay. But if you have any questions, you can email me. How about this? Is your the employee that makes your candy, are they full time or part time? Uh, it's, hmm, how would I explain this? So since it's a subcontractor and I'm hiring through a commercial kitchen, her first job is doing catering with this company. So when she's free, she's making candy. I really can't, you know, mm -hmm. call on her whenever I want and say, I need you to make candy. It revolves around the caterer's schedule. And since they're giving me such a good deal, I do have to respect that. So for the short term, that's what I'm doing. But for the long term, what I'd like to do is once I gain a little more revenue, I'd like to put a down payment on a building and hire employees for myself. So yeah. Any other questions? Yes? How can you trust um, someone that you, are, that you just know, I mean, that you don't know yet? Like, say, if I'm interviewing these people and you hired me, how do I trust these two just because? So like, are you asking about the hiring process and how I know if somebody's a good candidate? Mm -hmm. OK, so for example, for my um, uh, commercial kitchen, what I've done, I should probably put that back there. 
um, for my commercial kitchen. I just know, my mom's known the owners for over 20 years. She's worked with them a long time. And we know that their hiring motto is always hire better than yourself. So when they bring in their candidates, it's almost like using a referral system. Since they're, you know, I'm trusting what they tell me, what they tell my mom. So once they tell me that, then I know that I can trust the person that they've hired. Um, but when I'm doing things on my own, I, I really think actions speak louder than words. It's something that my mom always tells me. If you say you're going to do something and then you don't do it, I mean, I think it all comes down to first impressions, for example. I mean, if you have a good way of articulating things and if you give me good feedback if I'm not doing something that you think I can do better, that's what I look for in a candidate, somebody who knows more about what I'm doing than I do. So like when I hired the employee, I, she's a baker, so she knows all about you know, cooking in general. So for example, we had an issue with burning the bottom of the kettle. My employee's like, if you put it on a little bit lower heat, it will take longer, it'll taste the same, but it won't get as burnt on the bottom and you won't have to spend time scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing when you clean it. I just look for people who are experts in that area. So you mentioned navigating all the legal aspects, both mm -hmm. federal and state. I know that that's something people were afraid to go forward with. Did you seek help with that? Or yes. Or did you just have to read the fine print? So when I was having help, um, like my mom, she's been in business for years. My dad has been in business for years. I mean, there were times where I would fill out a form and I don't understand something, and, you know, I'd feel embarrassed, but then I would ask my parents. I mean, for example, as an adult, I'm sure if you guys, you know, you guys can't run to mommy and daddy sometimes. So if you know somebody that's already in business that, you know, can, can you just send them an email and say, you know, I'm not understanding this. I understand that you're busy. Is it possible that you could sit down with me and help me fix this? It all comes down to knowing people. If you know people that are skilled in business, then you can be skilled in business because you're surrounding yourself with the right people. I want to add on the question of that too. So I know that they're constantly changing the laws. How do you keep track with what's constantly changing? Well, I'll get letters. I mean, sometimes the state, I mean, we had a while back somebody that was like a referral system or somebody emailed acting like they were the Department of Revenue in my email. And my mom and I took that very seriously. But then we later got a letter from the state saying, hey, there's somebody out there in Arizona that's actually trying to get your money. And we need you to you know, just know that everything's still the same. I mean, because most of the time when there's a change in regulations, the state will contact you. Because if your license is about to expire or something, the state will contact you. Never through email, never through calls, but through letters. So. Any other questions? Yeah, who's your mentor? My mentor? I have many. Um, I think somebody who's influenced me the most is my parents, for example. Um, both my parents, my dad's been in finance since 1989. Uh, he worked on Wall Street. That's where he was trained. My mom, she's the, um, wait, let me think of the term. How would I explain this? She's the assistant to the CEO of the, um, of the head of Russell's Institutional Division. They deal with lots of numbers. Both my parents are in finance. Then my aunt, she's in accounting. My other aunt, she's all about marketing. I have all these kind of different outlets that I can go to. And then my grandfather, um, he's just somebody who inspires me, came here from Mexico with $4 in his pocket, um, my mom's family. And he came here with $4 in his pocket, and he built a business empire that he still runs at 85 years old. He, he works all the time. He's somebody who's never sitting. And then my other grandfather, you know, he was in politics, and I'm somebody who's all about speaking your opinion. And he's taught me, you know, to speak up when you don't like something. And then my grandmother, she was in real estate my dad's side and she's in the top one percent I just have all these people around me the owners of the commercial kitchen um, they've just been a huge support every single time that I'm feeling upset they're always comforting me my family does the same thing when I don't know something I can ask them a question and I know that I can get a reliable answer I mean somebody else that inspires me is this is kind of out there <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld I'm big into <laughs> comedy okay I love comedy I want to be comedian on the weekends I, that's what I like to do it's my passion and Whenever I listen to him, you know, I have, um, excuse my French, I'm going to say this, my mom's going to be extremely upset when we get out of here. She'd be like, Jordan, you're in trouble. Okay, you never say that in a presentation. I have in my bathroom when I wake up every morning, Jerry Seinfeld's three rules. Number one, bust, bust your butt. Just say that. Okay, number two, fall in love. And number three, I think, like, <laughs> I should memorize this. It's like, I, I have it though. And I look at it every morning. And it drives me to do what I do every day. When I'm down, I think about that. Or like when I'm sad or when I'm, 
upset, I go home and I listen to Jerry Seinfeld do a, a, do a comedy, comedy routine, and it brings me up. I mean, I feel that happiness is something that motivates people. When you can't work hard when you're sad or depressed, it may push you to go farther, but you really can't be focused on one thing when you're unhappy. And happiness, I think, plays a big factor. Um, somebody else that's a mentor to me is a woman that you guys may know, Miss Jane Taylor. Uh, she is the head of a um, charity, and she's somebody that knows a lot about business. And she's worked in the business arena in the Northwest for many years. And she's somebody that has faced a lot of adversity in the workplace. And she's taught me, you know, that you can thrive from adversity and it doesn't just have to bring you down. And then my parents as well, because my mom and dad, they tell me that when you fail, there's always something else ahead of you. God has a plan, because I don't want to bring religion into this. But for me, since I have a relationship with God, I feel that, you know, God has a plan for me. If you're not religious, that's fine. But just know that, you know, there's a plan ahead for you. So. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Okay. And another question. I mean, you're way ahead of a lot of people. Thank you. And my thing is, it's like, with business, were you just like born with it, or was it trained upon you? Because you read a lot of business books, and you, you understand your numbers, and you sound like you you know, been on Wall Street for the last 20 years. <laughs> Can you explain, where, where, where's this business acumen come from? Well, number one, I'm an only child. Okay, so my parents, like I, I've never been somebody who's clicked with kids. I don't really get along with kids. To me, I, I'm just like kind of an adult person. I'd rather hang around with adults. I mean, my parents have wine dinners and I'll cook the meal. I mean, that's just what I've grown up with. When they talk business, I've just grown to understand what they're talking about. That and I feel, I don't want to brag, but I'm just going to say this. My mom always tells me that I was born with this sense, with common sense, I guess I should say. Like, see, my mom's back there making a face, like. <laughs> and I feel like I've just kind of been born with common sense, and I've been taught from my mother and from my father, you know, think about this logically and not idealistically. If you think about things logically, you'll find more and more that it's more understandable than you think. Sometimes, and I'd say almost all the time, people overcomplicate things. Things are a lot simpler than they appear when something looks hard. Any other questions? Like <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have an, another question, unless somebody else has. But my, I'm just curious, you know, I mean, you, uh, we talked about vertical, other verticals within your company. I mean, obviously, you know, you're 13 years old, you're cute, you're going to get in the door, and everybody, you're going to make some concession, give you a little bit more latitude. You're going to get older. You're going to grow some whiskers, and you're not going to look so cute. You know, I, I shave. It's all, it's all good. Know, how do you... What, what's, what's your plan, um, you know? Once I get older? Yeah. Well. Besides law school and all that, I want to know, I want to know the details of the day. It's just, you know, the end goal is to keep their legacy going, right? Are you saying what I'm going to do once I'm not a kid? Yeah. Okay, so. With the business. Yeah, once I'm not a kid and, you know, people are like, oh, he's an adult now. Well, I think my main goal is to scale now because once I get the contacts now, people will say, oh, I knew him when he was seven years old. I knew him when he was 13 years old. You know, he was this little kid and he had this vision and this idea and this drive. And people will say that to other people and they'll be like, wow, he had that from that young. He must have more experience than most people his age. So I think that's one driving factor because if I grow my business now versus later, then it, it will be better in the long run. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit then about the scalability of it? Because it looked to me from the slide that you had gone to individual stores. Right. But Metropolitan Market, I mean, aren't they a chain or something? I'm, so uh, do you, or um, like the made in Washington types of stores, you know, are, are you looking at chains at some point? Or? Um, so I would say right now I try to think local because if I can get local, that becomes national national becomes global it all comes down to steps so like for example when I go into a store I'm not thinking is this a chain is this an individual store I go in and I think I'm just gonna show them my best me I'm gonna show them the best parts of my business and I don't really think about that aspect what I do try to think about is can I fulfill their orders for example metropolitan market I knew I could fulfill their orders because if I start small they have a chain, yes, and I can just keep going to another chain, and another chain, and another chain. And before I know it, I'm at all those chains. So right, like right now, 
I'm looking at going to the West Seattle Metropolitan Market because of my in at the Tacoma Met Market. And how I got in there was, you know, I just had five little touch points with the manager. You know, I'd call the manager's office, they wouldn't answer. So I'd see the manager and I'd say, hey, you know, I'm Jordan Allen. You know, I've contacted you a few times. Here's my card. Please check out my website. And, you know, I had five of those little touch points. Eventually, they called me back. Hey, we'll have a meeting with you. So I go in and, you know, I talk to the manager and the assistant manager. I give them this a presentation like this. And then they're like, okay, we like this. We're going to go to the next step. They bring in the buyer. I don't give her a presentation. She just fires questions at me. And I have to answer them. You have to know that you, again, know your numbers. Because once you know your numbers, you can really get anywhere once you have that scalability. So does that answer your question, or is there anything else you'd like me to um, get? I guess it doesn't answer it entirely. Okay. So, um, so you've got the process down for one-on-one -on -one with an individual store. Mm -hmm. um, but you're talking about scaling up. And I'm, I'm not a business person, so this might sound like an ignorant question. But I... I um, I'm just wondering if you really want to do the scaling up over the next four or five years, right? Um, if you've thought about how you're going to build that framework for scaling up. I mean, once you're in two metropolitan markets, then is that enough to say, okay, I can, you know, I've got, I've got good references from, from two different stores. Now I can go big for the chain or... Well, I think it, it's, I take things one by one. I, so, f for example, I'll think, talk about a book I read. It's called The One Thing. And it really set my mind to not just think, I mean, I try to think about the future, but I also when I have a short-term goal, I have to fulfill that before I fulfill the long-term goal. Something my dad has always taught me, and along with this book, is you have to have little goals before you achieve something big. So, like, for Metropolitan Market, first I'm going to start local. And I'm going to go to Seattle. And then once I get to Seattle, like you said, references play a part and they will reference me to the next door that they suggest, and eventually I'll be at all seven. And then I'll go to another chain because I have references from them. Does that answer your question, yeah, or is there anything you'd like me to finish? No, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Um, so you talked about your candy, and you're very passionate. How can you avoid people who aren't a fan? Because, of course, you have Google, and then you have these reviews, and some people can just attack you, and they don't even, they don't even care. How can you avoid that? So I've had people thumbs down my video about trying to, you know, a teen trying to help cancer. I've had people thumbs it down. And you know what? That's okay. They're ignorant people. And I feel like today, I'm, I don't want to, I'm just going to say this. I feel like the millennial generation, I feel like people really need to grow thicker skin. I mean, you really have, I mean, for me, I'm like, you know what? You can't just expect everybody to love you. You can't just expect that. This is a world, okay? The world is not perfect. You gotta go out there and you gotta be like, you know what, there are haters out there. Let them hate. You can't change that. You need to just accept that. And for me, I've just come to know from my parents, that this is an actual world. There are people who are not nice in this world and you need to accept that because in the end, they'll have, something will happen to them. You know, they're may, they're, those are just unhappy people. I mean, come on, people, karma. What goes around comes around. Something's going to happen to them. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Do you do any advertisement on social media? Uh, I don't have social media. I, don't, I mean, I believe in social media, but I don't. I've had some horror stories with social media because, you know, I'm a teenager. Stuff happens on social media. <laughs> um, right now, I'd like to make an account for my business, but I think I'm going to wait until I'm a little bit order, older and a little bit more mature. Um, so, are there any other questions? Yes? Yeah, say your company took off and got bigger. I know you said you wanted to buy a building and get a bunch of workers. Would you be willing to give up any quality of the ingredients or process in order to make, to commercialize it to make it a bigger profit, like scaling it to bigger stores and whatnot? Would you be willing to give up the homemade process for more of a, for more efficiency? I think you don't have to sacrifice quality for efficiency. For example, stirring. You don't need somebody just to stir, stir, stir. The equipment costs a lot, but you can get a mechanical thing that'll stir, and then there's a wire, and it'll transfer, and it'll pour it on the slab. So, I mean, you can also do that, and you, you don't have to sacrifice quality. You don't have to, you know, pay for workers. So you can still keep that. I mean, Brandini is a global company. They have assets all over the world. They have accounts all over the world. But they still have managed to keep the same quality that they did when they first started out of their house in California. Are there any other questions? Are so. you going to test some of that? Oh, so yeah. 
I actually, hmm, how am I going to do this? Okay, so I have some extra bags, and why don't we do a game? Why don't we do a game? Let me think. What's a game we can play? We could do an ultimate rock, paper, scissors tournament, and then whoever wins gets the bags. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, yes? So how much influence or education was actually from going to school versus outside influence, like your family and all that? To have you have this mindset of maybe drive to go down this route at um, your age now, because like we're a little older and it's all intriguing. And had we been wanting to look into it at your age, I can only imagine where we've gotten would have been now versus trying to figure it out. And you haven't. I would imagine if you haven't been to college yet, yet you're thriving like this. So it's amazing to hear all that. And I just wonder, like. School played a factor with all family and maybe outside. School did not play a single factor, okay? You don't learn business in school. You don't. You're born with it, okay? Either you have it or you don't. I'm just going to put that out there. My mom always tells me either you're born with a sense or you're not. Sometimes people don't got it, okay? For me, I, my mom and my dad did pay, play a big influence in my life. My family played a big influence in my life. And when you're out there and you know you have people around you telling you the right things, you'll understand the right things and you'll understand how to move forward. But it was also just something that came natural. When I was three years old, I've known I wanted to start a business. Um, so like for example, I was a very idealistic kid. I was like, I'm gonna make a car company and I'm gonna make a gymnasium inside of a limo. I'm like, yeah, that's ridiculous. You know, we're little kids, you have crazy ideas. But I always thought of business my entire life. The day I, I came out of my mother's womb, my mom looked in my eyes when I opened them. She goes, this boy is an old soul. My grandmother said that. And that's something that stuck with me my entire life. And I don't think that'll ever change. Any other questions? I have one. So being in school and having your own business, when you're going through school, do you notice at some point, like teachers tell you, oh, you're going to need to know this someday when you're working for a business or have a business. Do you feel like, no, that's not how that works? OK. Um, <laughs> so are you asking my opinion? Oh, oh, I always voice my opinion. Right. If you're asking. If you're asking whether I'm ignorant or not, I can be very ignorant, as you, I think you may have seen. Like, you know, I, I kind of can sound condescending, and that's something I'm working on. So, like, at school, I always try to, like, I want my instructor to explain to me why this is practical. If something's not practical, then I kind of get upset. Doesn't mean I'm not going to try at it, but I may get upset. I may get frustrated. As my mom may attest, you know, I'll come home with, for example, Common Core Math. I don't know how many of you guys know what that is, but it's a system where they try to make math not about getting the right answer, but using the right formula. So I would get very upset because I would get the right answer, but I wouldn't you know, show them the work the way they wanted me to do it. So I would get really mad because I'd get things wrong. And I was like, OK, I'm just going to do this. But I just wish that people would exp explain to me more while things are, why things are practical. And to answer your question about you know, voicing my opinion, I do that a lot. <laughs> I mean, if I don't like something, I'll either raise my hand and say, you know, does this make sense? Can you explain to me on a wider, like on a more of a wide scale, more of an abstract thing? I want to know why I'm doing something and not just I'm doing it because you're telling me to. I'm somebody who doesn't thrive on that, and that's why I changed schools. It's because in my old school, everybody was in the box. Somebody who's like, if you tell me not to cross that line, I'm just gonna go like, <laughs> and I'm gonna keep walking. So I need, you know, somebody to explain to me why I'm doing something, and if they don't, then I'll get upset. If you've had like more experience than, say, the teacher, and they're saying one thing, and you know it's just not that way, how does that go over with them? Oh, <laughs> like I'll they, just they say something because they think they know it, but they haven't actually experienced it. You're like, oh well, I'm you know I'm upset in on something like that. Well, I'll give you an example. I'm not going to specify my political views, but in sixth grade, we're having a political debate on election day, and my teacher was yelling at me about an immigration thing. So she told me I knew nothing about immigration when all of my family are immigrants. All of my family, three out of the four of the people who are here with me today were born in another country, okay? They've told me about immigration my entire life. It's something that we're always talking about. So when I know she's telling me something that's not true, or that I don't know something, then yeah, I get upset and I'm not, I'm not afraid to debate with that teacher. Like she had to pull me out in the hall and she's, you know, like, why are you debating with me? This is my classroom. And they got an email, and I got an email home, and my parents were like, why are you doing that? I'm like, because I know it's not right inside. I like to stand up for what's right and not for what is, what is what somebody's telling me to do. I feel that 
it's my moral obligation, even at 13, to defend my views and the views of other people. That, because I think all views should be respected. So any other questions? Is that it? Oh, okay, I guess that's it. Um, thank you for all, all for coming.